Welcome back to Glass Bren in the month of April for our monthly garden tour here on The Great Alternative. It's a beautiful sunny day. We had a frosty night. The weather's been really changeable. We've had loads of rain, but also these beautiful warm spring days. And today we're gonna to talk a lot about no-dig beds, making no-dig beds, compost, humanure, manure, compost toilets. We're gonna to recap a little bit on what's been happening this month here in the garden and talk about what projects we're getting into. So this time of year in the tunnels, we've got loads of spring greens available to eat. We've got spring cabbages, chard, rocket, spinach, all kinds of things like that. Some things are starting to go to seed, go to flower. So it's, it's time to start thinking about turning over some beds and we've been planting some of those new beds. I had a couple of setbacks this month. One being that I forgot the pump was on and drained the whole 6,000 litre tank into the tunnels in one sitting, which was a bit of a setback. Luckily, we've had some rain since then. And also the heated seed bench malfunctioned, so it surged up to 35 and killed a few of our tomatoes, but luckily not all of them we noticed in time. But otherwise things are really going, things are really moving now, it's getting much warmer and there's that kind of sense of urgency to get things moving. We're starting to prepare the beds outside for planting. We've already sown a bunch of stuff outside and the seed house is really full now of seeds. First of all, we're gonna go and have a look at a couple of no-dig beds that I cleared and prepared yesterday and Jason's gonna come and give me a hand to dress them with our beautiful fresh hot compost. Let's go. Okay, so yesterday I cleared these no-dig beds behind me um, of the kale that had been sitting in them for a year. Got rid of all the weeds and they're just about ready to have a fresh layer of compost for the next spring planting. So Jason, do you want to come give me a hand? Okay. Yeah, so this is what a couple of beds look like before we dress them with compost. So they're already really in good condition. You can see if I stick my hand in there, that's a really nice depth of, these are the oldest no-dig beds in the garden. So they've had quite a few years, probably five or six years now of, of repeated dressing with fresh compost, laying of organic matter. And we were just saying before, this exactly reminds me of the scene in The Matrix when Agent Smith is like, like that, and then overtakes <laughs> yeah. people. Me too. Yeah. Because that's how I'll remember this, not just through other actual important means. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, there's a lot of reasons to go with no dig. We've gone with it because first of all, it leaves the soil uh, the soil food web, the life in the soil intact. It's the most important reason. You know, we're not turning the soil, disturbing it. It also high, holds a lot more moisture. So all of this organic matter that's going on is holding a lot of moisture. It's like a sponge, really. There's a lot less weeds, a lot less annual weeds. The crops come off a lot cleaner, which is really good for us when we're harvesting for veg boxes. Generally speaking, it's a lot less work. We have them on contour, so the natural line of the hillside for the reason really that we want the beds to be all level and the ditches between them crucially to be level because that's where the water stops and sinks. And you mentioned that in February, is that yep. right? Yeah, I in think In the February is, video, yeah. Abel shows how he did these contours, if yeah. you're interested. Yeah, and I suppose our style is to create these, these 75 centimeter wide beds with wood chip pass in between. And what we end up with really is a, it's just a solid landscape of food, a kind of a foodscape as I talk about it. So uh, rather than kind of a garden with very defined beds with grass passing between what we end up with is just a sort of solid landscape, a highly forageable, mm. highly edible habitat essentially mm. filled with food where you can't really tell where the beds and the paths are. It's just, it's just kind of a mass of, of food, which is a really great way to grow lots of food in a smaller space, make use of your space, cover the ground, keep the moisture intact and create habitat for wildlife, insects, birds, things like that. So what do you need me for this morning? So today we've got do? some hot compost that we made and we're going to lay that on top of the beds. <laughs> there you are, please. Come on. Oh, this is excited. So if you didn't hear that, we're going to grab some hot compost from over here, lay it on the beds. I'm probably going to do this in time lapse. Come here. So cue the music. Come here. Girl, good girl, hello, good girl. Yes, hello, you're a good girl. So only have one rake, I'm afraid. Oh no. Yeah. So do you want to do a bit? We'll take turns. Yeah. yeah. Well I was gonna be I was gonna not be so nice and just get able to do everything, but <laughs> I suppose. So... Really, if I was in your booths, I would have made me do everything, because that's the point, yeah. is I'm the you know, the lackey, the visitor who's learning. 
So this um, this compost we just laid on, this is made kind of using what's called the Berkeley method. So mm -hmm. most of our composting happens in very quick, hot piles of compost rather than your typical slow, cold compost that you might do in a, you know, in a compost bin or in a pallet bin you make yourself or something like that. Because part of that reason is that we want to have compost available at lots of different points in the garden rather than at one point. Because of the slope, we need to make sure we're, you know, shifting things around as little as possible. It also is a way that you can make compost really quickly using higher temperatures and making sure that the compost pile is aerated, so with lots of turning. Yeah, and in this compost we've used fallen leaves, cut grass, there's a mix of manure and wood chip in there, there's quite a lot of wood chip. Uh, we've also kind of accelerated it with nettles, yarrow, comfrey, and that's all kind of layered in a, in a quite a specific ratio of generally speaking two-thirds brown materials to, to one-third green materials to have that balance of carbon and nitrogen. Do you use um, humanure? Uh, we don't use humanure on the veg growing beds, but we will use our humanure, our compost from the compost toilet, on the bases of fruit trees way, you know, that are kind of far away from the veg growing areas. Why is it just fruit trees? Why can't it be used? Um, you know, do, would, it, would it have to be composted at a certain temperature uh -huh. for a certain amount of time before it's safe to use? What makes it sort of unsafe? I guess it's the, one of the main things is the medication. So obviously in the modern times, we're using a lot more pharmaceutical medication. So it's to make sure that stuff has time to break down. Because we're you know, semi-commercial, because we're selling our veg, we need to be you know, a lot more careful around using human manure and how we use it because we're selling our veg to the public. Um, so, okay, if you were just doing this for yourself, yeah. Obviously, you know what medication you're on. So let's yeah. say in, the, in this circumstance, you weren't on any medication. Can, I believe, can it, can I'm, it be I'm really happy to grow a veg in, in human manure, yeah. You know, there's a time when it was really, you know, it was used as a, a vital resource, but somehow we've, you know, we've separated our, our waste from our food production and we mostly use animal manures now. Alicia has mentioned she's read in the human manure book, as long as you compost hot enough, compost will pretty much kill everything other than bleach. Yeah. It's like when you hear a fact like that, it's like, well then what? Yeah. As long as it's been composted properly, why can't you use yeah. anything? And, yeah. and I suppose maybe, it uh, makes me then wonder, yeah, maybe do a bit more research into the chemical makeup of particular medications might be similar to maybe something yeah. to do with yeah. the thing that does not breaking down in bleach. Yeah. I don't know. And you know, you'll, you'll, you might be freaked out by the idea of d dealing with your own poo, but um, after just a few weeks, human your lo loses its smell for example it doesn't smell anymore after just a few weeks um, and then yeah after two years we'll see later it's kind of it's this beautiful crumbly black rich stuff that yeah I'd happily handle with my bare hands it's not you know it's it's really about coming back into an intimacy with with our waste and with the beautiful potential of that for growing food but yeah I will I will again insert that disclaimer that we do not use it on the veg growing beds here in the market garden um, and never would. So for your compost on site, yeah, take me through exactly, especially with the no, within the no dig method. How much do you use, and where do you where does it come from? I'd estimate that we're using about 30 tons a year on a three acre no dig market garden site. We make a lot of our own, so we make a lot of our own compost. We also do kind of we mix manure and wood chip together and kind of compost that under tarp. And then we also use a local municipal compost from the, the local tip. So they, they collect all the kind of um, wood chippings and tree cuttings from around the county to make a kind of organic hot compost up at their site. And we use a bit of that as a kind of top dressing. So we always use it in companionship with our own compost because we feel like ours has got a bit more structure, life in it, and we make sure it's got everything we need in that compost. But, but the black stuff that we get from the local municipal facility is, is a really nice top dressing and helps us to kind of have the quantity we need to continue to do no dig on this size. Every year we're trying to increase how much compost we're making on site. But given that our compost making is still very manual, very human based, um, it's difficult to make enough for our needs at the moment. So forgive me, how, how much did you say you use of, of a general year? General year seems to be around 30 tonnes. Yeah, 20 to 30 tonnes. And how much of that is made on site compared to bought in? Probably 50-50. So 50-50 comes from here. Yeah. Out of that 50% that comes from here, how much comes from the fact that, you know, we have a working farm around us, yeah. so I guess you do use so some of the material. Uh, almost 100% of the materials are from on site. So the, all the manure is from on site. Uh, some of the wood chip, but a lot of the wood chip is donated by tree surgeons. So that's a waste product from them. 
we get some of our grass cuttings donated from gardeners, landscapers. Um, so some of it comes from, from outside, uh, but it's only stuff that's kind of a waste product that otherwise would be dumped or um, yeah, not used. So yeah, it's a nice kind of network. We're making use of relationships and kind of bringing together waste materials from, from here, but also from around the local area um, to make our compost. You have to think a lot harder about where you're getting your stuff, where you're getting a consistent supply from. You can get issues with compost, you can get issues with residues of chemicals. And that's particularly true of hay and straw and some manures. If you don't know where your manure is coming from or you don't know a lot about the farming practices that went into producing that manure, you can end up with residues of certain chemicals, pesticides, herbicides that can actually end up killing your vegetable crops. So you have to be really careful of that. I'd be really wary of straw and hay particularly. But also, you know, yeah, there's a fixation in, in, of like having a closed loop on the farm, but that's not always possible and not necessarily what we want to aspire to because it's really good to reach out, create networks and relationships. Absolutely. To sort of close that loop in a bigger way using, you know, working with the community. No dig, you know, do it to the best of your ability, basically. <coughs> to do it properly, you need to have a lot of organic matter. So um, don't be too hard on yourself if you can't produce enough to be fully no dig or, you know, there's also a lot of value in just being minimal dig, no, you know, low till and minimizing how much you're digging, yeah. What's next? That's great. Um, so we're gonna have a look at the compost toilet after all this talk about human manure. Yes, great idea. So welcome to the compost toilet down in the trees just on the edge of the market garden. This was all built similar to the shed. We talked about that, I think last month. We used all kind of local roundwood timber from a local timber merchant that we work with and also reclaimed timber, reclaimed roof sheets, just lots of recycled materials. And this system that we've chosen works on wheelie bins. So we've got a couple of wheelie bins in there. We've always got one in, in operation. And that wheelie bin has been retrofitted with um, ventilation on the inside to make sure that there's airflow going through the compost. And then essentially we're just collecting the poop, the human manure, into wheelie bins. It takes about a season, I would say, one, one year to fill a wheelie bin. And once that wheelie bin's full, we move, we move all the toilet across to the other cubicle and shut down that wheelie bin um, for at least a year. So it has a year in the wheelie bin to break down. And then we take it outside, put it out into a pile, put it under tarp and give it another year under tarp. So all the human manure has two years of composting time before we use it on fruit trees. It's a dry toilet. So there's a urine separator, which keeps the urine separate into a separate tank. And when people have done their business, essentially they just put a handful, a couple of handfuls of, we use wood chip, but you can use sawdust as well um, on top of it. So what's going in there is a mixture of the poop and wood chip and sawdust, a nicely balanced compost. And then we have a really cool hand washing station, which we took out of an old uh, butcher's van. So that's just a pump system, which means we don't need to have plumbing or electricity or anything down here. So it really embodies that produce no waste principle of like finding ways that we can reuse everything that might be considered waste uh, on a, in a truly kind of regenerative foodscape uh, garden to the point where there is no such thing as waste really. So I thought it'd be really cool for you to see some ready to use human manure. So we've got some two year old human manure, which we're gonna take over to some of our fruit trees on the other side of the site, um, which is nowhere near any of the veg growing. And we're gonna lay it on and you can see what it looks like and, and how beautiful it is. So here we have some two year old human manure. That's ready to use. Beautiful stuff. Completely rotted down, crumbly, lovely, full of worms, ready to use. And you can smell, there's no odor, just smells like really good compost. So, I'm gonna get some of this for our fruit trees. Okay, so now that I've just filmed you doing the difficult bit, carrying the wheelbarrow all over here, I suppose I should help a little bit. So let me know what should we, what, should, what would you like me to so do? So we're just gonna tip this around the base of this. I think this is a conference pear tree. Um, so this is far over the other side of the site, past the polytunnels. Um, so we've just got a few fruit trees in here. Um, so we're gonna tip it all in, right up close to the tree. And then with, with gloves on, Jace, you can just spread it nicely around the tree. So this isn't a typical time of year that we would be mulching fruit trees. Usually you do that in autumn time, 
to kind of emulate the time when the trees are dropping their leaves. Um, but it's fine to do it this time of year. It's fine to do it any time really. So the reason we mulch fruit trees is partly to cover the ground, kind of suppress the weeds around the trees so that the trees got the best chance of, of um, you know, growing without competitors. Mm -hmm. And also uh, it holds moisture. So it holds moisture close to the roots where the tree needs it. If you're not able to water your trees often, that's a really good thing. And obviously this is really high uh, nutrient dense, um, lively compost. Um, so that's gonna really help feed the soil that the tree's growing in, um, feed the, the mycelial networks, the fungal networks, the bacteria, create a really healthy soil food web around that tree um, that it's gonna thrive in. Another thing I was here recently doing, that I guess is it's something that you do to earn extra bits of money on uh, through Glass Bren is was filming a workshop. So uh, tell me more about those, you know, how yeah. do you treat having workshops um, on site? Yeah, so I guess that's always been a really important part of what we do, communicating and demonstrating around the practices we use and the way we're growing food and the community we're building. And also it's really important to bring people together, people, growers, people interested in these kinds of ways of living, to bring them together to create and facilitate spaces where they can have conversations, they can connect, they can learn, share knowledge. Um, so that's what we do. We do these um, a lot of these Saturday day workshops. We did a whole series last year and we've just started our 2023 series with creating regenerative foodscapes, which you joined us for. And the purpose of that workshop really was to, as much as it was to share practical techniques around permaculture design, how we design really regenerative growing spaces and gardens. It was also about kind of looking at the way we think and act as growers, kind of um, developing ourselves into the kind of regenerative growers that are able to vision and deliver on a, a really truly regenerative foodscape, focusing on our own relationship with the land that we're going to grow on before we leap into kind of working and turning it into, into our, our vision really. Uh, and then we went through some of, some of the permaculture principles and techniques and design tools that we can use to kind of um, vision a landscape that is abundant with food, but that also creates lots of habitat for wildlife, stores water, stores carbon, and that is really regenerative for people as well. That came up a lot is creating spaces that are that help people to thrive within them too. So, yeah. So when you're running a site like this, obviously your main income is um, veg boxes. Mm. Is that correct? How do you approach and what are your reasons behind kind of adding on workshops and doing workshops as well? So it's two reasons. I mean, there's a business reasons that it's, it's a, a supplementary income. So it's, you know, it's, it's about not depending on one thing, not just depending on the veg for the income. Uh, to be a truly sustainable business, we need to have multiple income streams. At the same time, it's just about the fact that we, we are really passionate and really enjoy bringing people together on the land. That's, that's the, probably the biggest part of it, really. And um, as much as we'll be sharing information and we're teaching and we're you know, sharing our techniques, it's also about all the knowledge that's in a group when you bring them together and how you create spaces that for that to flow and pollinate. And for me personally, I love facilitating, it's something I've done for a long time. I really love facilitating groups. I love seeing the magic that happens when you bring people together and take them through certain processes that can, can bring out the ideas and bring out the passion and bring out the imagination. And because that's what we need to kind of imagine new kinds of food growing systems and, and a new, you know, a new world essentially is we need to activate our imagination and, and believe that it's possible. And, I love sharing techniques that make that possible. Okay, I think that's it for today's month. Before we go, I've got something that you could also do, and it's gonna be a bit of a shameless plug for another video. Another thing that you can do at this time of year is go and forage materials for weaving. And the types of things that you can make out of said weaving materials that you can forage, things like a random weave willow basket, or a foraged, what did I call this in the video? A wreath. Uh, a forest, for, foraged forest wreath. That's what this one is. So if you're interested in watching videos about how to make either the random weave willow shopping basket or the foraged forest wreath, then uh, wait till the end and click on the videos. Okay, thanks everyone, and we'll see you in the next one. See you in May. Cheers. Thanks guys. Time for lunch. Yeah. Yeah. I can't make it first, but. Permaculture Market Garden, month of April. Let's get started. Welcome to Last Friend. In the month of April, let's go for it. I need to do that again without kicking the thing over. Try that again, Jason, try that again. Did that work? I think so. Smooth? Yeah. 
Yeah, go Silliness. for it. It's, these transitions are working. Okay. <laughs>